good evening, good afternoon, however you prefer. Welcome to the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education meeting for 2 6 2024. Uh, we like to get on record that uh, Mr. Doss is not here uh, because of medical reasons, and we see our esteemed Mr. Brown walking in. So we have four board members and uh, we'll proceed at that. And uh, I would like to ask anyone that has uh, electronic communication devices, to please, ma'am, please, sir, put it on uh, silent or you can turn it off. Uh, with that said, we were kind of waiting around for our, our student uh, to do our pledge, but I don't think they have arrived. So we are going to... Uh, just stand and do our prayer and proceed into our pledge. So let us stand, please. Father God, we come right now just thanking you for another opportunity, thanking you for grace, thanking you for mercy. And we ask, Father God, that you lead, guide, and direct us in our business proceedings tonight. And we ask, Father God, that we have a a mind and a heart for our scholars and our staff and all those concerned. We ask this knowing that you can and you will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Let us pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, for that. At this time, we will turn it over to uh, Mr. R. Centel Brown for our school spotlight uh, for tonight. Mr. Brown. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Holmes. We are here today to do our 2024 February School Spotlight, and it goes to Atkinson Elementary School. Let's give it up for Atkinson Elementary School. <laughs> Down in the flats, it is located in District 1, and they are an amazing school. Here's what's going on at the school. There are 390 scholars that attend Atkinson B. Elementary, Susie B. Atkinson Elementary School. The mascot is the Bears. How many faculty staff members work at your school? 60. A quote from the principal on why you love being the proud principal of the school. I love being the proud principal of Susie B. Atkinson Elementary School because I had the opportunity to create a positive first school experience for our scholars. Positive early childhood experiences are essential for student success, and I am proud to be a pillar in that foundation. What good things are going on at the school socially and educationally? We were recognized as an iReady School of the Week, and we received the distinguished status for PBIS. Let's give it up for them. All right, all right, all right. Scholars at Atkinson, B Atkinson Elementary School have a new dance team, student ambassadors to help increase leadership opportunities and school engagement. And what is the school doing to promote diversity, in equity, inclusion among scholars, families, and staff? One, implement educational programs that celebrate diversity by providing scholars with an understanding and appreciation for different cultures, backgrounds, and perspectives. We ensure leadership position and roles within the school reflect diversity. We provide ongoing training for staff to enhance cultural competence and awareness. This includes workshops and professional learning. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, let's give it up for Susie B. Atkinson Elementary School. Looks like some of our amazing uh, administrators from Susie B. Atkinson are here. If you would please join the Board of Education up front, and we will take a photo.
Mr. Chair, that concludes our report for the Griffin Spaldings County School Spotlight. All right. Well, Mr. Brown, uh, you, you have so graciously uh, accepted responsibility for handling the uh, system announcement, so you can proceed to that, please, sir. All right. Thank you so much, so much, so much. All right. We are here to present one of our scholar clerks who really does not need an introduction. He is not a stranger to anyone, and I don't think the boy has ever met a stranger. Have you, Zion? Have you ever met a stranger? <laughs> he is just so involved in what's going on here in the community and what is going on in our school district. Uh, Saturday at the eighth annual Black Heritage Festival, uh, Spalding High School had a choral ensemble, and they did a uh, duet with Kobe Wellmaker and Zion. And so, um, I was surprised to see that you sing, so um, learn something new about you. But like, he needs no introduction. Zion Wilson, who's in the 11th grade at Spalding High School, uh, a couple of activities and clubs and organization that Mr. Uh, Wilson is a part of. Superintendent Advisory Council, Peer Court, Rotary Interact President, FCCLA, HOSHA Vice President of Membership, Georgia Hybrid Corporate Board Member, Volleyball Manager, his college of choice is Georgia State University. Uh, his major is looking at political science, either pre-law, and he is a junior deacon at Grace Paradise Fellowship Church. And that's where Mr. Holmes is the pastor. So um, praying for the junior deacon and then definitely praying for, <laughs> praying for the, the man with the cloth down there. So uh, we are excited to have Zion before us. It's on you, sir. Um, Chairman Holmes, members of the board, and Superintendent Simmons, my name is Zion Wilson. I am a junior at Spalding High School. I would like to thank um, everyone here today and the Board of Education for involving scholars of this district in policy and legislative process. So, the announcements for February 6, 2024 Board of Education meeting are as follows. February is Black History Month. February 5th through 9th, 2024 is National School Counseling Week. February 12th through 16th, 2024 is National FCCLA Week. February 19th through 23rd is the Griffin Spalding County School System President's Day and Holiday and Winter Break. Pre-K registration will be February 27th through March 11th. March 1st, 2024 is Read Across America Day. March 4th through 8th is National School Breakfast Week. March 3rd through 9th is National School Social Worker Week. Tuesday, March 5th, 2024, is the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education work sessions, which will be held here at 216 South 6th Street, Griffin, Georgia, 30223, at 4 p.m. Governance team, cabinet members, and stakeholders, this concludes the Board of Education announcements for Tuesday, February 6, 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think he kind of made me nervous there when he grabbed that microphone. I thought he was getting ready to raise a hymn or something. Oh, oh, he can do it. He can do it. Yes, sir. He has great leadership and training. We appreciate you, Leader Holmes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Holmes, that concludes our system announcements given by our scholar, Zion Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for uh, taking on these uh, roles this, this, uh, this evening. I know you walked into it, and uh, we just thank you for always being ready. Let church say amen. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to get an adoption for the agenda tonight, please. So moved. We got a motion. Can we get a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. All right. The agenda has been adopted. Recognitions, Mrs. Sue McDonald. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to recognize our GSES district level spelling bee winner and our district S stage promising practices star award, Dr. Tiffany Taylor. Dr. Taylor. Good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that I recognize our spelling bee uh, winner at this time. The Griffin Spalding County School System held its annual spelling bee on January 22nd, 2024. The annual spelling bee is open to grades four through eight. Each GSCS elementary and middle school held a competition in November to select one student to advance to the district level. The Griffin Spalding chapter of the Georgia Association of Educators, also known as GAE, 
awarded the winner and the runner-up with trophies and gift cards. After multiple spelling and vocabulary rounds, Rehoboth Road Middle School seventh grade student, Makaya Sampler, won with the word sauna. Makaya Sampler will compete against students from seven other counties in the GAE Regional Spelling Bee on February 24th in Conyers. Let's put our hands together for Makaya Sampler. Now for the STAR Award. On Wednesday, January 10th, 2024, Griffin Spalding County Schools was presented the S Stage Promising Practices STAR Award as best district for our MTSS work of maximizing instructional focus to close learning gaps. The Georgia S Stage team visited Jordan Hill last spring and was able to see these promising practices in action. The Georgia S-Stage team also found significant evidence of these practices happening across all GSCS schools in grade bands. Ms. Phillips, the MTSS coordinator, alongside the GSCS assistant principals, MTSS specialists, and teachers from each school were inspirational in their efforts to close the learning gaps of MTSS students by 30% in reading and math as evidenced by iReady. Please help me congratulate them for bringing home this award to Griffin Spalding. The fo yes. <laughs> the following team members presented this work and helped receive the S Stage Promising Practices Star Award as the best district for promising MTSS practices in the state of Georgia. The team members are Ms. Dasha Phillips, GSCS MTSS coordinator, if you'll please come. Dr. Chandra Bell, Jordan Hill Elementary Assistant Principal, Ms. Robin Davis, Kennedy Road Middle School Assistant Principal, Ms. Candace Stedman, Spalding High School Assistant Principal, Ms. Ray Aragon, who is not present, serves as the Spalding High MTSS Specialist, Dr. Sharia Burney, Kennedy Road Middle School MTSS Specialist, and let's not forget Ms. Anna Rivera, Jordan Hill MTSS Interventionist and Teacher. Please let's celebrate these um, amazing staff members. And Principal Dottie English. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this time, uh, I don't think, does it, is everyone okay without us taking a break and just flowing through? Everybody okay? okay? If you have to leave, please feel free. 
uh, to get up and leave, but we're gonna, gonna go right on through uh, without taking a break since we have such a short agenda. But if you have to leave, I know Miss Bell got to go home and cook for Clem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank y'all for being here. Amen. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, we have our consent agenda items. Uh, have you read uh, all of our consent agenda items? If so, could I get a motion to accept them as they are? So moved, Mr. Chair. Got a motion, can you get a second? Second. Got a second. All in favor? So we're raising right hand. Four, zero. All right. Action items. We have. Okay. All right. We have the advancement of individual via individual determination. A V. Dr. Taylor will come and present that. Okay, so board members, um, we are requesting at this time a one-year partnership for AVID for the 24-25. I'm, so, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, Dr. Taylor. I said AV, but uh, AVID. We, we understood what you were saying. Okay, and public so, school. AVID, it does stand for, um, as you've stated, Advancement via Individual Determination, also known as AVID. Uh, this program we have been implementing since the 22-23 uh, school year. Each uh, year and each summer, we have been uh, afforded an opportunity to take uh, teachers from the middle school and the high school to receive training on instructional strategies. Uh, that help our students with college awareness and then also helping to identify and support students for additional courses of rigor. So at this time, it is recommended that the Griffin Spalding County uh, Board of Education approves the use of federal funds to secure this one year partnership with AVID at a cost not to exceed $60,000. Uh, this will cover the travel and also registration for our summer AVID training. Board members, you have heard from Dr. Taylor on uh, AVID, individual advanced individual determination, and we would like to uh, get a motion to accept this as presented. Can we get a motion? So moved. Got a motion. Can we get a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Raise Discussion. Your hand. Discussion. Go ahead. I just want to say that this is a great program. Anything that we can do that will help with student outcomes, we are so excited as a board to be able to support that. And we know that AVID has helped with student outcomes. We know that from the conferences that you guys go to and come back and re-deliver, we are so excited to be able to support this program once again. And that's my time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you for that comment, Mr. Brown. Uh, next on the agenda. Vote. Did we, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You're welcome. For all. Next on the agenda, we have the Griffin Spalding County School System 2024 Summer Learning Partnership with SPUR. Ms. Barbara Austin. How you doing, Ms. Austin? Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Oh, Good evening. you calm tonight. I'm calm tonight. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to be before the board, our own Superintendent Simmons. Thank you so much. Um, Interim Chairman Holmes, it is at this time that the Division of Teacher and Leader Effectiveness is bringing before your request to enter into a purchase services contract with Spur Staffing's after school labs to assist GSCS in the day to day human resources management task of implementing our 2024 Summer Extended Learning Time Program, also known as our Summer School. Um, we have established a great relationship with SPUR. Uh, SPUR has come before the board on um, uh, previous occasions. We're working closely with them now with some of our staffing needs here within the district. So it is at this time that we'll come before you with a request that will be able to provide our staff with um, beneficial opportunities, one that will be paid every Friday, which would be beneficial to our staff. Uh, we will be able to continue um, our small classroom services to our kids. Um, the day-to-day -day approach would allow us in federal programs also to be able to monitor um, the effectiveness of our programs and also provide support to our teachers as well. 
Um, we will continue to have our own staff to be a part of the programs. They will be, um, have priority um, as part of the program as well. That would be our teachers and our site coordinators on each school site. Uh, of course, our summer school this month, this year will be the same as last year to run the month of June and to give our teachers an opportunity to, of course, have part of their summer um, as well to relax. Um, the cost of providing these services will be no more than $700,000, which is um, less than what we have spent um, in previous years, and we do see that we're going to come under that just with negotiations with um, SPUR and making sure that we're being good stewards over that funding, um, as well as, again, um, we'll be able to provide additional services to our staff. Now, the cost does not include transportation coverages. We're doing that in-house still. Our transportation department has been excellent in making sure that we have those services in place for our kids so that will remain within our district. Um, our nutrition, as far as feeding our students, that will continue to remain as part of our district services as well. Mr. Wilden, the department does a great job of that as part of the extended summer program to be able to make sure that we're feeding our kids during the summer also. Um, so it's at this time that we're coming before you with a recommendation that the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education approves the request to enter into a purchase services contract with Spur Staffing, the after school labs, to provide human resource management services for the 2024 summer school. Thank you, Ms. Austin, for that presentation. Board members, you heard from uh, Ms. Austin. Uh, what is your pleasure? Just have some questions. Yes. Go ahead. Discussion. Discussion. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Hey, Ms. Austin. Hey. I was curious, have we done this in the past? Have we, we, worked with have we used a staffing agency in the past? For summer school? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am, not since my tenure. Okay, that's what, I don't think we've done it since mine either. I'm not sure, but okay, all right. Um, what happens if we don't spend the 700000 Maybe we can get through it with less than. Okay, that is, that is definitely the plan. We've worked with the contractor up to today and we feel good that it's definitely gonna come under that amount okay. of money. And then just one other question. I know you, it says here for like 600 students, I, I, I don't think we've ever had that many in summer school. Are we, is it gonna be different this year? Is it? No ma'am, actually last year we had more students that we served last year. Um, if you may recall, we did invite over 1,100 students right. um, last year and we had over 700 to attend. Oh, last I don't, year. I don't remember that. I thought it was around four. I remember for like 500 or so. The year before, okay. yes, ma'am. But last year we had over 700 kids um, that participated. And will summer school be at just certain schools again, like it has yes, been? Yes, ma'am. It will at our three of our elementary schools and our two middle. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. Hey, Ms. Austin, how are you? I'm great. Great. Um, so using Spur staff is going to help how? using SPUR staffing services will allow us to have centralized support to the district as well for summer school. And we have a small staff in federal programs and it does stretch us during the summer to end a school year, start a mini school year during the summer, close out and be ready to start up the next school year as well with federal programs. And so it would be an assistance to us. We're not gone. We're there side by side working with staff, but it would allow us to be able to really look at the effectiveness of programs, the implementation of our programs with the staff that we have. Okay. And now last year, year before last, we know that there have been some issues as it relates to um, logistics stuff. All of that is getting worked out now, so everybody is at the table yes, now. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank so you. Can you kind of just. Up. Give us like an overview of where you are, where we are right now. With yes, that. sir. Mm -hmm. So our curriculum we're using this year will be an extension of the regular school year, which would be our ready. Our ready give us that opportunity to have those pre-test scores that mid and also towards the end. Um, to that point, yes, sir. has that already been planned out? Assessments and all of that. Dr. Greer and the team is on that this year. Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, continue. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we're, so we're going to be using that as our curriculum. Um, we will still have the SEL component like Lego. We gave the kids some enrichment components there, so we'll still have that there uh, for their experience, as well as for any of those courses that require any sort of testing, required retesting per se, that gives our kids an opportunity to see some growth there as well. Okay. And... 
how often is the committee meeting to pull everything together? Oh, we almost talk daily. <laughs> we actually had a couple conversations today, um, but we are meeting regularly to be able to discuss to make sure that we're aligned. Transportation is part of the conversation. Our special ed department is part of the conversation. Nutrition, so everyone involved, we, we're, we're pretty candid with the conversations. Okay, awesome. Um, I, this is just, and maybe other board members may not want this, but I think that um, this will be good to have in our weekly update, Dr. Simmons, just you know the progress of what's going on with, with summer school just for us to be able to uh, know and be able to, um, of course, direct questions back to uh, central office staff. But I think this would be good just for um, us to understand what's going on in the event there are any questions, we can um, reach out and ask you in that event. I have some additional comments, Mr. Holmes. Go ahead. Um, uh, Ms. Brown, are you finished? I, I'll give it to you. I, no, I'll, go right ahead. Okay. No, you right um, ahead. So you mentioned so everything is pretty much already planned out. Transportation is involved. We have a transportation director here. Um, are there any challenges that you think that you will have this year? Well, this is the first time we'll be using um, assistance, third party assistance. And so we're trying to make sure that we are covering bases from our experience and having support for anything that does come up that we may not be aware of. So I don't expect any major challenges because we are having the conversation um, so early on and there's all of us at the table to be able to have those discussions because no one person knows it all. And so that's why we're all at the table um, having those discussions. Um, we're just trying to plan and, and give the kids the best experience that we can this summer and to think of things um, that, that we may not see. But that's why we're all around the table this year together. All right, I think that'll satisfy me for now. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. While Mr. Brown was asking you just a couple more questions, Ms. Austin, if yes, you don't mind. Oh, um, so using this staffing agency, so these will be, of course, we'll use some of our own employees, but these employees will be above and beyond our own. Is that correct? That is not the intent. The intent to hire is in, in our district, okay. our staff, to be a part of our program this year. Okay. So and that is the intent. Yes, ma'am, Mr. Howes, our staff as part of our project this year. Okay. Have we ever had a summer where we didn't have enough summer school teachers? Um, I've not experienced, last year we actually had more. Had more? Teachers okay. last right. year, if you recall, okay. we had triple digit staffing. That, well, I guess that I'm a little confused as to what, what will this staffing after school, I mean, what will it do for us that we don't already do? Yes. Well, for, for our department, again, going back to federal programs is a small department, and we manage a lot of the summer school operational pieces. Yes. Um, and so with different grants closing, like ESSER, cross-functional year, things of that nature, we just want to make sure that we're giving our staff and our program the support that they need, and having a smaller staff, this allows us to close out one year instead of getting ready for another year, school, mini school year is essentially what a summer school is, is another mini school year. It would allow us to be able to support the program better from okay. our department and from our team. I guess the word staffing has me a little confused. Okay. Because we're using, if we're, if we're gonna use our own employees. So they're, hi they're helping us make sure the hiring process, the onboarding process of staff, um, the payroll component that comes with that, ensuring that that piece is done every week. Right now, we do do that in-house, um, and we do do that two, three hundred times a month for some cases, depending on how many time sheets are coming through. Sure. So it just allows us to be a little bit more efficient. Um, I guess you could say from our end, from the operational piece, this would really be a help to make sure we're supporting our staff timely as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Everybody okay with your questions? Good. Thank you, Ms. Austin, for uh, that valuable presentation. Uh, if you would, I, uh, I, I hope you don't slip out, but I need to speak to you after the meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, I need, you to help, need your help. Yes, sir. On something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have presentation and yeah, discussions. Take a vote, right? Uh, did we vote on it? No. I'm sorry. Uh, we did the discussion before we uh, did the vote. I'm sorry. Correct. I let I let Mr. Brown get ahead of him. I ain't gonna do that no more. Uh, <laughs> can we get? Vote on. Can we have a mo motion? <laughs> for, he can't get ahead of you. This is our last vote. <laughs> can we get a motion to accept 
this presentation as presented. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept the presentation for the 2024 Summer Learning Partnership with SPUR. We got a motion. Can we get a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Vote for for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, next presentation and discussions. Uh, we have our strategic plan update. Uh, you going to do that? Yes, sir. Okay. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, it is my intent to provide an update on the district's strategic plan. Um, I will get through some of this. Uh, you see the template. You, you're familiar with this. It is my intent to demonstrate how uh, our non-negotiables of professionalism, accountability, and effective communication come into the district's overall strategic plan. It is also my intent to demonstrate how we leverage the results pyramid to ensure that the beliefs necessary to get to the actions uh, will continue to afford the results that, that we are seeking. Uh, the focus areas of, of literacy, enrollment, attendance, and discipline remain at the forefront. I think you'll see um, the efforts of the staff and the district addressing these focus areas within this strategic plan update. So a vision of a distinctive brand, uh, strong leaders in great schools, all of that you're going to see again. I won't give it a whole lot of airplay in, in, in these slides. I want to give you more of a, 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 a a visual, literally and figuratively, in just a few seconds. But to empower each student to graduate college and career, career ready remains the mission. So you've seen this before. This is a part of our presentation template, but I'm going to go through what these blue boxes represent, how we leverage the blue, box, blue boxes. I'll also go through what the green boxes represent what they mean to us in the strategic plan, as well as the gray boxes. Board members, you often don't hear about our strategic priorities, but my intent is to demonstrate how they drive the intentionality and the urgency demonstrated by the district's staff. So first things first, uh, what I want you to take away from this slide is all of the activity and the work that goes into it. Uh, I just talked about the green boxes, the blue boxes, and the gray boxes. What I want you to see is that for the most part, the staff has began uh, the largest part of the work. What you haven't heard me say that I need to be clear about, this is a five-year plan. This is year three of said plan. And what you see this year, you may not see a continuation of next year. What you saw last year, you may not see a continuation of this year particularly if we felt that we've achieved the goal or we've achieved the objective or we have accomplished the initiative, okay? All right, so having said that, you're familiar with the visual, but I wanna, I wanna draw your attention to the theory of action, starting with that of the central office. What we're saying is that the function of the central office is to engage schools, family, and community via our non-negotiables. Th that is where it all begins. That's the origin of it. And again, that work touches each school, all of the families in which we serve, as well as the community. That's why you hear us talk about it so much. I'll say to you, as I've said to the staff on no numerous occasions, in the event that there is a situation, a scenario, or an incident in which we believe that an opportunity has been missed, it's usually because one or more of those non-negotiables were not executed the way that we intended. Moving on. In that theory of action, we talk about the function or the work of principals. And in this regard, it's the principal who functions as the instructional leader. The instructional leader establishes or cascades a culture that's supportive of rigorous teaching and learning activities and outcomes. I want to say that again, because while I may, have be, uh, while I may be able to state it simply, it is not easy work. But the principal is the person on each campus that is responsible for cascading or establishing a culture in which rigorous teaching, rigorous learning activities are able to be executed and observed. From the principal, we leverage and highlight the work of teachers and the support staff. 
When you hear me say support staff, I'm not merely talking about paraprofessionals. I'm talking about any person who does not teach. So whether that be a custodian, whether that be a bus driver, whether that be a, you know, a mentor, whether that be a behavioral clinician, wh whomever, wherever, everyone has a role to play in the execution and the implementation of the district's strategic plan. Those are the individuals, board members, who are supposed to foster and embrace an environment where students and staff alike feel safe and supported. And lastly, when it's all said and done, provided that central office is functioning properly, provided that principals are functioning properly, provided that teachers and support staff are functioning properly, you should be able to observe and students should be able to participate in activities that promote their personal and academic growth. That's the essence, those are the backbones, that's the theory of action relative to the strategic plan. This visual, you don't hear me talk about a lot, but I want to draw your attention to a few things. One, you see the restatement of the district's vision. Again, distinctive brand, strong leaders, great schools. Strong leaders are in support of both the brand and the school. I've talked to you about the work of the principal, but I also want to reiterate it is not the work of the principal alone to ensure that the brand is one that we can all be proud of and the schools are ones that people can say are functioning the way that they desire or that they need. What you often don't hear me talk about uh, are these three pillars and the first one being leadership. Be reminded leadership is not a title it's a role, it's an expectation. In my belief, in the staff's belief, in your approval, what we said is that everyone has a role in leadership. Whether you are a classroom teacher, whether you are a student like the one who just came up and did the announcements, whether you are a parent advocating for your child, everyone has a role to play in leadership, thus that being a part of the mission. The second pillar of success is teaching. You don't necessarily have to be a certified employee in this school system to be a learning resource. Anyone who is considered to be a learning resource, whether it be of the you know, Georgia standards of excellence or, or, or simply leadership moves to be taken you know, in various situations, those are opportunities to teach and model. And then lastly, learning. Learning is not only the responsibility of students when it comes to the district's strategic plan. I say those things to you in this setting because in the absence of one or more of those things, the plan as a whole is compromised. And so it's important that you board members, those who are listening and those who understand it at the staff level recognize, learners aren't age specific, leaders aren't title specific, and teachers aren't credential specific. That's the essence of our plan and that's probably one of the uh, stronger components, but it is, a, it is also a more difficult component because that's a mindset shift. You know, that second order change when a person who's not used to seeing him or herself or being viewed as a leader takes on that role of that work, and, and we need to continue to work through that, and you'll see opportunities in which we're doing that successfully and opportunities in which we need to continue to focus on that. So there it is. You have the blue boxes. Those are the objectives. 12 objectives, it is these objectives that create the initiatives that are embedded throughout the district strategic plan. Again, initiatives change from year to year. Sometimes they, they may change um, within a particular department, but not necessarily in the strategic plan. Secondly, we have these goal areas here. These goal areas, board members, it's important for you to understand the goal areas transcend divisions and departments. Said differently, while you may see student achievement, that is not the ownership of a particular department. That's the ownership of every employee in this school system. While you may see high performing staff, that is not the ownership of human resources. That's the ownership of every employee in the staff. Again, the hardest part, the most rigorous part about our particular strategic plan, it is not designed for someone or some department alone to lift, execute, or implement. It is a collective and collaborative work, thus requiring a lot of leadership, a lot of teaching and a lot of learning. Lastly are these strategic priorities. 
It's the strategic priorities that demonstrate the intentionality and the urgency around the work that you can observe in any given area, on any given campus, any given day. Next, I want to share with you the ballot scorecard. Dr. Warren, if you would pass out these hard copies. Um, board members, I'm going to give you hard copies. Uh, in the event that you want to get into something uh, based on what I, what I commentate on, you know, we'll be able to pull that up live as well. What I want you to take away from what's on the screen in the moment, board members, just because it's red doesn't necessarily mean it's a detriment. Just because it's green doesn't necessarily mean that all things are well, okay? I want to be clear about that. We recognize that there are opportunities for false positives. We also recognize that there are opportunities for false negatives. What you don't necessarily get to always understand or see is some, some of the measures are compared from quarter to quarter. Some of the measures are compared from semester to semester. Some of the measures are compared from year to year, okay? But it's important for you to know and understand it's the balanced scorecard that helps us to determine if the actions that we're taking, if the initiatives that we're developing, if it's the goals that we've established are moving us into the direction that we want to go, okay? While it is my preference and my desire to always be able to say that there is more green than red, what I'm more concerned about being able to say is whether or not we're doing the things that we've planned to do in the manner in which we've planned to do them during the time in which we've planned to do them with or for the people in which we've planned to do them. I just gave you a lot. I'll pause now, let you take a look at the first set of scores. Be reminded this is only inclusive of the first semester. Okay, this is only inclusive of the first semester. What's on the screen and what's in the first page of the document that you received is the first goal area, organizational and operational efficiency. What I want you to take away from that board members, if I were to go backwards, what's different about this particular visual is this strategic plan is scaffolded from the bottom up. It is not driven, spiraled from the top down. Said differently, we don't concern ourselves with student achievement being accomplished until we get the foundational pieces in place. Said differently, we have to be efficient in our organization and in our operation. We have to ensure that we have the appropriate personnel doing the appropriate things. From there, we have to engage the community to make sure that they're aware so that they know when and where to help. At that point, should we begin to concern ourselves with whether or not we're getting the academic outcomes that we desire to get. I'll share with you, if, if one or more of those foundational goal areas are compromised, it's gonna take us longer to get to the student achievement outcomes that we desire, okay? Uh, Dr. Simmons, have a question. Yes, sir. So as it relates to uh, on page two of the Roadmap to Success that Dr. Warren handed out, we're at um, align resources to scholar and staff needs. Yes, sir. Uh, target 33%, where acts quarter one actually 20%. Uh, target for quarter two is 66%, and acts with 50%. What are we doing in order to, uh, I guess, pay close attention to, um, you know, what resources need to be aligned and how they are um, appropriated at the different locations? So that, that's a good question, and, and the rigor in that question is that I, that I did not do a, an appropriate job with. The district scorecard that is, a, is a collection of performance in the school. Uh, and so while, while we're all in the same month and calendar date within the school system, schools are in different places of implementation. We're reporting out our ownership of where our schools are, at, where our schools are and trying to make those provisions. If your question is what are we doing more of or differently, we're targeting those schools who aren't progressing the way that we thought or that they thought. I think I've shared with you board members, we have a structure that's titled a performance review in which we go back, allow schools to tell us how outcomes are being established, how their strategic plans are fed by the district, the district strategic plan, and what are we not able to uh, accomplish in our rollout of said initiatives that are enabling schools to move forward. Without looking at a particular school, I wouldn't be able to tell you specifically uh, okay. what, what that school's needs are. And so would our 
climate specialists have that information, or how, what would, how could you get that information to me or any other board member that wants to know? I would, I would ask that you try and figure out more specificity in the question when, when we talk about aligning resources, or I may have missed some right. of you. So I guess the, the concern comes being that, um, that it shows that it's in progress, and obviously there's been work to support it, and so I would like for you to speak to, I guess on this particular line, what supports have been put in place so that um, at the end of the day, we're able to align resources to scholar and staff needs. Specifically, share, share with me the performance objective that you're speaking to, sir. All right, so. I'm on the far left. If, so if you look at number two, um, the performance objective is F, align resources to scholar and staff needs. Give me just a second. Mr. Harper, take me out of this presentation and take me to the, uh, thank you. Give me just a second. Goal area one, please. Right, so it's goal area one, organizational and operational efficiency. And the objective is at the top of the second page, F, align resources to student and staff needs. Right. So again, one school may, may be demonstrating a need for more support to address, you know, whether it be chronic discipline. Another school may be demonstrating, you know, the need for more support to uh, double down on, on reading growth without knowing specifically, I wouldn't be So, able to but do in that. other words, you can identify what schools those are. Yes, sir. Okay, so what I would like to do is set up an appointment with you so that we can go over, um, you know, what, what the plan is to sure. uh, support these schools, being that in quarters one and two, uh, we are 20% and then at 50%, we, praise God for the growth, but just like to see what needs to happen more of or less of something right. uh, and which schools in particular are, since they're not listed on this particular objective, um, to give us that information. Sure. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Board members, are there any other yeah. questions in that regard? Go ahead, go ahead Ms. This is, and so, you know, I, I had a conversation and I'm familiar with um, the work that we're doing in Breakthrough. Uh, I've talked to you guys about Breakthrough and the partnership that we have with a, uh, with a you know, external partner called District Management Council. Um, off the top of my head, that work is associated with those schools that are participating in Breakthrough. Um, it's, it's really just a data protocol. My memory is not completely accurate because I've been up for a long period of time, but my belief is of roughly 150 students who are participating in, in that particular initiative, upwards of 130 of them have met their targets. We just got that information based on already. Um, it, it's not where we want to be, but it's, it's, we're not regressing. But, but I am familiar with that measure. On the, on the first page, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Simmons. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, section B about the present safe and supported learning environment. Yes, sir. That, that's always a concern, school safety and things of that nature. I, I'm just curious as to how did we uh, come up with a target number of 946 uh, for the number of discipline referrals, how, how do we set that criteria? That, that's another good question, sir. So typically what happens is we, we take a look holistically at schools uh, and, and we establish targets based on previous data or baseline data. That was a number that we you know, took into account from how schools performed last year as well as in conjunction to the programs that we have in place. Uh, and based on what schools did last year within those programs, the pivots or the shifts that we're making to intensify those supports, to intensify the training, to identify the schools sooner, we're forecasting or projecting where we'd like to be. I believe the, the, the measure that you're talking about was somewhere old, you know, upwards of 150 or 60 referrals higher than where we'd like to be. I'll be candid with you, that's also, um, one of those scenarios in which that data comes directly from the student information system. 
um, what you will hear from the staff is that I really am not a fan of quantifying disciplinary referrals. I'm a fan of quantifying whether a certain behavior has increased or decreased. Uh, but that's a little bit more rigorous. But, but that's how we get to the number. If Zach Holmes Elementary had 100 referrals hold on, hold last on. year. Say, say that again. <laughs> if Zach Holmes Elementary had 100 heard referrals that, right? last year, uh, our goal would be to try and decrease you know, the number of referrals based on feedback from, from said school, the administration, and the, the referrals or, or the content written on the referrals. Sure. Uh, makes sense? Uh, uh, yeah, makes sense. Uh, and, and that kind of leads me, and I was going to get with Ms. Austin afterwards because uh, for those that, that are not aware, uh, there, there's going to, I'm hoping it would be a big push from the governmental entities to address a big safety problem that we have uh, in our system. And what I was going to ask Ms. Austin, uh, are there federal dollars monies that's out there have you researched for us to tap into to provide because you were talking about the summer program but uh, I, I think we have to think outside of the box uh, kids not not only need that for the summer but they need it you know year round is there money we can tap into to provide alternatives uh, for our scholars uh, because we all know that an uh, idle mind is the devil's workshop. And, and I'm just thinking outside of the box to uh, see if there's money available to put things in place for kids throughout the year, not just the summer. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'm excited to hear that because uh, I, I think we, uh, I think it's kind of hit home and we got to ear that it's not just a school system problem, but what we're dealing with, with safety, with our scholars, uh, it, it's, it, it's happening all over the country and it's a community problem. It's not a, just a school system problem, and uh, the school system shouldn't be dependent upon to resolve it or solve it just ourselves. So yes, that, that's why I'm so excited to hear that. Well, I, I, the, the, I guess the only other comment that I'll make is while, while I do not uh, posture the school system to deflect, you know, some of the burdens and the undesired behaviors that we see in our schools, uh, at the same time, what, what we have tried to figure out is how do we balance what we are expected to do, which is demonstrate academic and personal growth, and then take on some of those non-academic or personal growth areas, such as you know, all things that contribute to the behaviors that we're seeing in the community. You're not going to hear me deflect from it. Uh, I just try to find ways to ensure that those who uh, came into the profession to educate on standards are able to do that and still support students. Those who came into the education profession uh, to lead are able to do that, but still support the staff who support the students. It has become a little bit more rigorous. Uh, we will continue to lean into that work, um, but it is not the work that was prevalent in schools a decade ago. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where I think I'm, I'm going to move on to goal area two board members. Uh, so goal area organizational and operational efficiency. Um, I'll put that back on the screen. In the event that you had questions, where you do not see, as Mrs. McDonald pointed out, where you don't see a, a particular measure at all, that's either a change 
uh, in, in, in the action item or a change in the measure from one year to the next. The, the platform that we use doesn't allow things to be easily omitted once it's entered. If you see something that is partially uh, completed or partially filled out, let me know and I'll, I'll provide the context. Um, your document will look differently from what I'm projecting in the moment, particularly when we get to student achievement, and I'll explain all of that uh, when, when we get to that point. So high-performing staff, again, um, more green than red, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is okay. That simply means relative to these particular targets, we are moving in the direction that we established to move. It does not abdicate us of the need to continue to observe new teachers. It does not abdicate us of the need to continue to ensure that the trainings that we provide are able to be observed. All of those things that enable us to create a high-performing staff, we're going to always lean into. The other piece that I would ask the board to be mindful of, this is a fraction of the work that the staff does in relation to these goal areas, strategic object objectives, or strategic priorities. And that is goal area two, high performing staff. <clears throat> Dr. Simmons. Yes, sir. So uh, same which where you're presenting on goal area two, high performing staff, performance objective A, support effective professional learning and growth. Uh, if you look at the one, two, three, fourth line, increased percentage of respondents that indicated that professional development highlighted effective practices. Quarter one, we're at 95%, I mean the target, and the actual was 92%, and it's red there. It's red because we did not hit the mark of 95? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. And in target two, quarter two, it's 97%. What was the 5% difference? Probably more people believing that the training that they received enabled them to effectively apply their knowledge or improve a skill set that, that was needed to complete a task. I'm going, again, without being able to go in, uh, I'm going to say more people at a higher rate indicating that what they received in terms of professional learning was more useful or impactful. And I think it just it, it speaks to, you know, if at one point they were saying that, um, that there were highlighted effective practices um, and then it wasn't actually shown, but then to see in quarter two, to actually see it, I think it just speaks to um, maybe it could be the resources or it could just be that they are now starting to get what they need in order to be effective um, in their particular role. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I'll give you board members um, a comparison, um, but, but two different circumstances. You know that we leverage the Let's Talk platform to, to support two-way communication. Mm -hmm. Our experience has been, if you, sub, if you submit a dialogue to the district asking for a bit of information, and receive an answer within 10 minutes. If the answer is not what you wanted, it may create a feedback score that, that is not reflective of, of a more than timely response. Mm -hmm. Some of that plays into it. Some, sometimes we may have uh, professional learning, again, that, that is more rigorous than others. Sometimes it may be a mandated PL as opposed to a chosen PL. And, and we try to be respective of, of all of those things in, as well, but I, I do think you're right. What I take from that is the staff's cognizance that if we're going to provide PL, let's finish it by ensuring that what the intention was made good or hit home with the folks who participated. I agree, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to con uh, sustain that type of momentum. <coughs> Make sense? Any other questions from goal area two board members? Yeah, on, on, on the uh, recruitment, what, uh, where we don't have any records, what, what what's the uh, explanation we So So basically in that regard, that's, that's an example of where what we did in a previous year, we did not carry into this year. Um, you should be able to see, but you don't necessarily see it. Uh, so in the top right corner of the document in your hand, you're gonna see this academic school year. If you look at this document, 
it, it's specific to the 23-24 academic year. Mm -hmm. If an action lifted in 22-23 but not 23-24, there would be no data. Some of them we can omit, some of them we can't, it's just there. And that's the, that's a, I don't know if you want to call that a quirkiness of the platform, or it may have been determined that, you know, we do not have a need anymore to, to deal with a particular action or, or measure. But with the, if I may, um, mm -hmm. with year two recruitment and looking at the performance measures, with Mrs. Battle's department, the things that they've done um, outside of the box to, to help with recruitment, um, would that not, would that, would not, would those measures not be able to list, be listed here? in this live document? Yet, well, not in the moment. We would have to go in and, and create an entry point for the scorecard. So, so again, everything that's captured may not be reflected. We, we tried to lift up what we call the high yield targets and, and measures. Mm -hmm. That may have been one in a previous year. Or again, it may have been something that was, in, was, was a focus area uh, that's no longer a focus area. But, but we have no, I mean, it literally says we have no records because we've not created any entry. So, I don't, I don't understand how being that in creating this strategic plan and using data and feedback, we've been able to, you know, amp up or ramp up things in human resources, why would it not be able to speak to that previously if it's high performing staff? Um, let me see, it could be goal, let me see. I just had the power. While, while you look at Mr. Brown, I can't say, uh, because I always inquired, I think before Ms. Battle inception here, we, we did not do a good job of keeping up, keeping data on recruitment and retention. And, and uh, because I, I know I almost jumped through the roof when she came in talking about it. Uh, we, we, did, we, 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 we didn't have data, we didn't put an emphasis on because recruitment and retention goes hand in hand, but we, we were not really focusing on that uh, so I, I know that's probably a piece of it that we just didn't have data because uh, we weren't keeping data on that. May I? Yes, Mr. sir. Chair. Mrs. Battle, do you have any recollection as to why that would read no records? And, and I am, um, Mr. Harper, uh, let me get you to go to the next slide. See, the reason that it's not on the depiction yet, yeah, go, go back one slide, Mr. Harper. The, the reason that it's not on the depiction is, again, when I, when I ran the report, you got it to include initiatives. Anything that's there or ever been there is, is on this document. If I were to pull it up live, I don't believe you would see this. That, that's a function of the platform that we use in Assembly. It, 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 it's a repository of information, if you would, and you've got to tell it specifically. Uh, but, Ms. Battle, do you have any insight? I don't want to be inaccurate. Yeah. Good evening, um, board members, Superintendent Simmons. The, what we were looking at in year one um, was centered around things like recruitment efforts of grow our own. Those were scholarships that we awarded to individuals as recruitment opportunities and retention efforts. Uh, we no longer have the ability this year to offer those benefits because those funds are no longer available to us. So that was our primary focus last year, that recruitment piece by offering scholarships to help people become fully certified. We don't track that this year because we no longer have that at our, at our disposal. But to that, <clears throat> But to that under high performing staff, it, you know, cultivate a committed workforce and supportive, effective professional learning and growth. So I think it's always been there, but maybe, go ahead. No, you're going in the direction. Right. I'll let you finish. So I think that it's, it's always been there, but I think that it was not specific to 
high performing and staff. So grow your own, yes, we were able to provide scholarships. Um, I know a teacher at Atkinson who was a part of that, you know, went to Mercer, finished in, in the classroom enjoying it. So we know that it's been effective, but I think that, um, and then also under attract quality candidates. I think that it, as we move forward and we look at this, if we not necessarily add to it, but just go back under Grow Your Own and the other initiatives that we've uh, provided in human resources that can reflect, uh, number one, uh, that we want to recruit and retain high quality staff um, and that we are here to develop and coach our leaders, whether you are a teacher leader, whether you are a custodian, whether you are a nutrition worker, um, we're here to give you the necessary tools that you need. So um, maybe if we could just go back and look at the different initiatives that we've used to update um, that may go along with Grow Your Own, that may go along with um, other professional developments that have been used through KickUp and other systems that can speak to uh, these pillars and um, those goal areas for um, the balanced scorecard. Understood. Thank you. Yes, sir. So how did we come up, did, did Ms. Battle, uh, who, who, who came up with uh, setting the target for, for uh, like, uh, retention? Uh, who, who, said it, who said in these? And we actually threats? look at historical data just to see where we were last year and push ourselves. We, we increased the percentage to challenge ourselves to go higher each year. So we just looked at where we ended at the end of last school year to figure if we wanted to have a retention rate of our induction phase teachers. Uh, we, were, we fell short last year, shorter than 84%. So we set our tar target at 84% and that's where we challenge ourselves. All right, you said we set it at 84%? We did. Okay, and so I was just confused in that all of these support, you know, in areas of retention rate, classified employees, increased retention rates in induction phase teachers, all of that supports recruitment. <laughs> Correct. So, so again, and, and I appreciate you bringing, bringing that point. What, what I tried to communicate earlier on is, is as we move forward through the plan, we, we may have, so while something is in support of a goal area, we may be on to the next effort, we may be on to the next iteration. So we, but you don't want a, a scorecard that you can't get through because it, it houses five years of various actions. But that, what I want you to take from what I just said, just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not an effort right. that the district is, is executing. And, and maybe in not, I mean, Dr. Blessing ran the report, or you ran the report? No, the, the report, yeah, it's not even a report, it's okay. just data. It's I'm data saying, because maybe, I don't, I mean, it's just, it could have been human error to, um, maybe to, maybe a field or something that was not clicked. Which, which one, are we still on? Yeah, on the C, on the, yeah, so I just, I don't know, it's just, it's just weird I to me that all those things support, um, and to just show where we are, um, that data is needed because when we're looking at recruitment and we're having the conversations, we're talking about salary studies and all those different things, right. that's important because that supports the work for recruitment. Correct. And, and so, um, Mr. Brown and, and members of the board, what I'm saying is even though you don't see that we, you know, you don't see anything about a, a supplementary uh, incentive to retain employees, you don't see that on here. You don't see anything about, you know, the number of thought exchanges. There will be there will be some instances where you won't necessarily see it here. If your ask is, hey, what, what I'd like for you to be able to help me understand is how do you establish what goes here, then I can do that. But there will be instances where you will recall seeing an effort in the district in your observations of visits to schools that you may not see it represented on the scorecard, or you may see something on the scorecard but you're not quite sure whether or not you've seen that in, in execution in the school. Okay. okay. Makes sense? Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. I just, you know, it's just still kind of like just out there loosely for me being that those are the things that were done to support yes, it, but got it. All right, so thank, thank you, Mrs. thank Battle. you for that dialogue. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Battle. Uh,
Board members, we're going to move over to goal area three, family and community engagement. And, and again, um, a, a prime example would be you know that we have school councils or local school councils in our schools. Uh, you don't see it reflected here, but those are measures that we're asking schools to keep up with. I can share with you that we try and keep up with that. We try to provide supports with schools when they demonstrate hardships of whether it be um, recruiting or, or, or getting the appropriate number of folks. Again, that, that's just another iteration that sometimes you'll see something on the scorecard that you may not necessarily understand when you see it in the school. Sometimes you'll be able to say, we do this, I've seen this, but I don't see it here. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's not being done. And, and, and so if it's a matter of me needing to be more clear about what you see and why you see it, I'll take that into consideration to make sure that we better communicate that in advance of the next presentation update. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Could I, let me ask yes, a question sir. of you and uh, Ms. Battle. What, what, what type of latitude do each principal uh, at the school level have as far as doing recruitment? Uh, what, it, it, you know, is it all just dependent on what HR does, or can they can they kind of freelance to go out and re do recruiting, things of that nature? What kind of latitude do they have? Mrs. Battle is smarter than me, sir. Uh, okay. so, so I'm going to let her speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we we actually encourage principals to have individual recruitment events. Um, just Saturday that passed, we had the UVA recruitment, very successful. That was we, five schools that we typically have a hard time filling vacancies. So we gave first priority. So that was the support of the district around those schools. We have targeted recruitment events where the principal can actually host it for their particular school. So we give a lot of flexibility there. We encourage it actually um, to speed up the hiring process. Okay. Board members, what I will add to that, if you go back to the statement or the function of the principal, you heard me say that it's the principal who serve as the instructional leader and it's their work to establish or cascade this culture. The reason that we encourage principals to get you know, out in front or into the trenches relative to the hiring or the recruitment or the, the creation of various vacancies is because it's their culture. And, and the, 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 the fit the skill set, the demeanor, the personality at school A may not be what's desired or needed at school B, Amen. but that's what you would get if it was centralized from Mrs. Battle's office. Right, right. So, but now, don't take that to mean we let principals go alone and right. flounder. Right. So, so again, we're, we're going to be there with them. Uh, the, the principal supervisors are going to be there with them because at the end of the day, my task and my expectation for principals, hire someone who can work in any school. Hire someone who can work at any school, uh, but ensure that they can work at yours. And, and so we don't want to get into the practice of sending people to places um, because that may not be where they want. But we do desire for this to be a place when we hire a teacher to go to one school, we're hopeful that they're able to go to any school. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so there you have it, um, you know, proactive communications, talking about the number of Let's Talk Dialogues. As you know, board members, we recently changed the website platform. You know, we have a digital app, um, and, and we spent time today with that, with that partner talking about ways that we can get better information, trying to monitor to what extent are people using the app. Even though you don't see it there, those are still efforts that I, I just want you to be confident that if you don't see it here, doesn't mean that we're not doing it. And just because you see it here doesn't mean that's the only thing we're doing. If you have any questions um, on your document, you may not be able to read it very well. Um, but I want to bring to your attention, if you, were, if you were logged in, you see this one. Let me see it. Yeah, it can't work. But where there is a figure that's underlined. Okay, and, and this is for you if you log in. So that, that information isn't public. You may not be able to see it from here, but if you were to turn around and you see the figure where it says 85 by, one, by 1433. If, if we were in the assembly portal, there would be some notes that let you know what that, what that number means. And so 
that gives us context because there's two, you, as you can see, there's only numbers, alphanumeric. But, but I wanted to make you aware, when you see that, just know that there's usually an explanation. And I bring that to your attention as I segue into student achievement because what you yes sir. It just goes back, because like I said, um, address the diverse needs of scholars, mm -hmm. increase participation. We know because I've, it's been in my email, I've seen it on Twitter, I've attended some of them, of the Title I workshop and informational sessions. But it's not, and I know there were several held in first quarter. Right. But they're not, like again, like I, know, I know what you said, it, but it's just, it's just, I don't know. I don't know why it's bothering me that it's not there. So, so that may have been to where not all the schools were able to get them up and going because we didn't start them at a particular time or they didn't take account for it. There's more clarity around what the expectation is. I would tell you that we were not anticipating that data collection in quarter one because we don't have a target status. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. the, the belief is first semester, second semester. I'm getting ready to turn around and ask Adam Pugh and, and see. Mr. Right. Pugh? What does, that, what does that data represent? Is this one of those efforts where we collect the data twice a year or do we collect this data quarterly? I'm looking at the Title I meetings. Twice a year. Okay, so that, and that was my suspicion. Okay. You, you understand how I got there though? But shouldn't, but even in that, shouldn't it be yellow to show progress? Well, or it's green because we exceeded it. It, it would have been yellow if we didn't exceed it, but showed progress. But it's blank. Where? Quarter one, increased participation of rate of parents attending Title I workshop informational sessions. Well, we, we, we collected at the end of the semester. Okay. All right. Makes sense? It does. Yeah. That's why you got it in quarter two. Right. That's why it's in quarter two and not in quarter three. It'll be at the end of the year. Quarter four. Yes, okay. sir. Got it. Yes, sir. Dr. Simmons, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. If, if no one else. Okay. Good. Thank you. The, the yellow box there, 53.06, that, that's kind of surprising to me. It, it is. Um, it, it's so disappointing is is um, probably not the, the the appropriate word, but I don't have the word. But what that what that what that implies is what we know. You go to any given school, and it's and it's hit or miss relative to whether or not parents have we have the accurate information, or they know how to get into it. And, and, and because of the way, you know, with the, with the mobile activity now, um, our goal is to stay above 50%, looking at it one and two. Preferably, if we could get that up to 70%, right. I, I think we would be better in a lot of ways. I just don't know how long it's gonna take us to get there. Because I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about during COVID, I know how many, I know we used our buses, but Wi-Fi on the buses to help children uh, get online during COVID. So. Now I'm sitting here thinking, I know there's just a, a little area within Spalding County still, but it's very densely populated that doesn't even have internet connection. Are we, can we do anything for those families that this may affect? And I mean, are children that take their Chromebooks home at night, are these, are, are they able to get online and study, review? Um, that kind of bothers me a little bit for from an educational standpoint not that our number is only 53 percent I, I think we can i think we can raise it to 70 by reaching out to parents and asking you know asking why because there's so much information in i see in um the portal that's important to parents right so i guess my question is i would like to be sure as a board member that all of our children can get on the internet when they go home and can we help them do that? Can we put hotspots in areas where kids can't do that, like we did during COVID? Um, so Mr. Harper, come out. What I will share with you, I have partnered with um, the county in support of establishing an infrastructure. That, that's a collaborative effort. Uh, we, we leveraged uh, you know, funding to do that. The hotspots uh, the, the maintain the bill, uh, to maintain the devices, uh, in COVID, everyone was doing it. Uh, no one now does it. I'll let Mr. Harper talk about what his office has the capacity to do, but I'll share with you that that, that area does not house, fortunately, a large or even a you know, significant part of our student population. 
but I, I don't want to, you know, speak out of turn and tell you what we do when he says we don't or what we can when he says we can't. So, Harper. Yes, sir. Um, during the COVID period, we were using ECF funds, the emergency connectivity funds, to provide the hotspots. Uh, that grant period has passed, so those devices we don't have. However, we do keep a cache of hotspots on hand for uh, hospital homebound students, students who are going uh, at home for learning for a while for whatever issue at school that they need to. So we provide those opportunities. Uh, towards the end of last year, some of our survey data, just to follow up with what ongoing uh, connection issues do we have across the district? Because we know the, uh, the Jordan Hill area out towards um, Orchard Hill, there are just low signal boosters out there. Um, that data that we did just but again that was asking people to respond to surveys I don't have it in front of me but it was 92 to 94 somewhere in there the people who responded stated that they do have home internet access uh, Miss Austin has been working with our partnership in T-Mobile in the Parent Services Center to make sure uh, that we can provide those students with extra internet uh, and devices as needed they've done a lot with working with um, Internet Essentials and the home programs that uh, AT&T has provided for the low, low cost. So it's like $10, $10.95 a month for home Internet access. Uh, and so she has been communicating that and I've shared with her some initiatives. Uh, it wasn't from the DOE, I forgot the last one that we talked about, but they are looking to partner with parents and students in our district to provide devices and home Internet access for free. Uh, but it's just part of, you know, parents taking opportunities. We've kept the um, partnership with Comcast and their Internet Essentials programs for years. But I think it's, it's a hard push to get parents to just take advantage of those opportunities. We have a lot of opportunities, uh, and Ms. Austin's really been pushing them also through her work with parents. that We have them. They're here. We just need parents to take advantage of them. Well, then it sounds like we need to get the word out. I don't know how you do that effectively and efficiently, but that's that's what you guys are known for, for doing. Yeah, that's that's what we've been working on a lot is just trying to push the message out there. Every time we get a new grant opportunity or just uh, a local provider opportunity wanting to make those partnerships, you know, we broadcast it out as much as possible. And I'm sitting here thinking that at some parents, the 47% that don't, there, you know, a lot of people are really scared to log on to a computer. I mean, could we have classes where, you know, you, you could put it on a video. This is how you sign into IC. This is how you sign into the, I mean, we could upload a video for our parents to watch. Oh, sure. And Maybe I think we have that. school and do it. And my department has provided parent trainings before. We've done that again with a partnership with Parent Services where we come in and we train parents how to access the Chromebooks, how to sign in, how to get to Infinite Campus. Uh, because the parent login is different than the student login and going through how to do that piece. Right. Uh, but we're always there to provide those opportunities for parents. Yeah, that's just a, that's just, yeah. disappointed is not the word. I'm just really surprised that it's that low. I, I'm surprised too, because we have so much out there and it's just right. really trying to pull people in to just take, take advantage of it. But I'd be knocking on the door of T-Mobile. I mean, because that's one of our big partners and, and um, you know, that's, that's great that they've done what they've done, but maybe they're willing to do more. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Um, and this is to that same, uh, looking at addressing the diverse needs of our scholars, increase the number of parents utilizing Infinite Campus or Parent Portal. Is there like a QR code that we could have at the schools while parentals are going in to, to check out their scholars or drop them off to where we can ask them to scan the QR code. Are you on Infinite Campus? Um, it just takes me back to my teaching days when, you know, they would try to do parking lot conferences or when we were doing before care and trying to have parent-teacher conferences when you drop your child off. And I'm like, are you on Infinite Campus or, or are you on such and such and such and so? just having that, that QR code or on that moto uh, so that they can scan and join right then and there. I think that in our, and I know it gets busy in the front office with a lot of things going on, but if 
the clerks or secretaries could, you know, just, you know, and having that conversation, you know, how are you doing today? Oh, are you on Infinite Campus? And if they give you that blank stare, what's that? Then you know that, hey, you can take about two minutes or give them the information so that they can go. I just think it's, we have to be able, if, if they're not coming to us, so to speak, to these informational sessions, then we have to meet them where they are. And while they are at school and they're picking up their scholars, I think that's an opportunity that we can use to kind of boost those numbers. And it's very helpful so that you're not having parking lot conferences that you can log on and you can see how Day Day or Shay Shay or Timmy or Johnny are performing um, based upon when they log into Infinite Campus. And so that's just a little extra push to see if we could just get our front office staff at our schools to just, you know, kind of help us out with that push to, to increase um, our parental activity and knowledge as it relates to uh, the systems and programs or, or um, capabilities to be able to check on their, their scholars' outcomes and success. So it's uh, just something uh, we can think about. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Pugh, for the sake of context, what is it that we are looking to discern parents' utilization of said differently, how are we measuring that? Is it a matter of parents using it uh, and we're taking a survey? Is it a matter of us having a contact, uh, a piece of contact information in it? Why is the number 55, not 100 or 25? Infinite Campus? So, yes, sir. I, I'll, I'll, it's not a survey. It's, I'll have to yield to Dr. Blassing game because I'm not familiar with Infinite Campus, but it's it's data that they're pulling from the system come to the podium doc uh. so that percentage is really the number the percentage of students whose parents active students whose parents have an active parent portal account so doesn't mean they don't have internet access it's just those parents who are actively using Parent Portal to get information on their students. Hold that thought. Um, Dr. Taylor, do we have a protocol of promoting Parent Portal uh, and, and uh, the, the benefit of using Parent Portal at the school level? Um, I can't answer that. I can talk about, talk about what has happened in the past. Sure. Um, I, I can't answer that. Understood. So, board members, what I will do, uh, because I, I, I did not, and I should have declared that earlier, part of, I think, the, the awkwardness is that the, the, the number is low, but I don't want us to lose sight of its two percentage points shy of the target. And I think some of that is a best practice, but what I will try and figure out is what is the performance of students for these parents versus performance of students for the parents that, as you uh, spoke to Ms. McDonald, appear to not have a parent portal? And maybe that will help us to discern or glean how to take uh, Mr. Brown's suggestions and, and push into it a little bit more. I tend to think schools are, are doing things to get parents involved. I do know that there are instances in which parent Mr. Brown comes in, the nice clerk, are you on parent, con, uh, parent, uh, parent portal access? Yes, but Mr. Brown being dishonest, not this one, he wouldn't do that. But that, that happens, you, you understand what I'm saying? And, and I, don't know if, I don't know if that's why we, we struggle with that, so we've got to figure out what the burden is. Uh, but if it's about parent portal, I think we, we may have misunderstood just like you said, connectivity, Ms. McDonald, or whether or not we're pushing it to the parents the way we thought we would. I'll let that go based on that. Thank you, Dr. Blasingame. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Yes, sir. All right, board members, I'm wrapping this presentation up uh, by sharing with you some information relative to student achievement. What's on my screen is, is half the depictions of the, of the pages that you see in your document. What's on my screen 
only, only um, informs two performance objectives. That is uh, providing or preparing college and career ready graduates and implementing a coherent and viable curriculum. The rest of the information that you see where all of those blanks are, that data is not available until, until the end of the school year. So rather than going through all of that and, and just looking at a bunch of blanks, but I wanted you to see what you have comes directly out of the um, balanced scorecard module. What's on the screen, what's being forecasted on YouTube is the, the information where there is data entered, okay? I'll share with you board members, if you look at implementing a coherent and viable curriculum, where it starts with fourth grade Lexile at or above the stretch band, mm -hmm. on your document it is red, but it should be at a minimum yellow simply being the target was 24, the actual was 24. Some of the quirkiness within the platform, you, you can manipulate it. Otherwise, it may give you what I said earlier at the beginning, a false positive. So you do know <clears throat> red does not signify staying the same or, or progress. It, it, it indicates regression, but in this case, it would not allow us to do that. So we went in and, and just made it yellow for the purposes here. Um, again, seventh grade Lexile, you can see the target was 26% in the second quarter, the actual is 31. On the screen, it's green. On your document, it's red. You understand what I'm saying? So again, I, I am saying to you in full transparency, I can manipulate this to make it look the way I want it to look. I'm just asking you to trust that the staff understands what the data means, they understand what the data says, and they're responsive to the data in real time. Any, any questions for me as I close out the strategic plan update for the school year 23-24? Questions? Having hearing none, or having heard none, Mr. Chair, that will conclude the uh, strategic plan update. I appreciate the work of the staff, both at district office and each of the schools and the respective classrooms because, again, the bulk of this data originates in schools and it speaks to our ability to either support, pivot, or sustain. And, and, and that's the the lens in which we apply it. So it's not a deflection of who is or who isn't. It's more of an indication of what is and what isn't moving in the direction that we desire. And I just want to make a comment as it relates to the presentation. Thank you so much for providing the update on our strategic plan update. We know that a lot of work has gone into creating with the different groups, we had scholars involved, we had parentals involved, community leaders, and of course, uh, employees and everything involved and so um, I just would like to follow up on the following items um, so if we could take notes that I would like to follow up on goal area one organizational operational efficiency for performance objective F and to know those schools that we can identify and talk about under goal area two high performing staff would like to follow up on performance objective a support effective professional learning and growth and to see what other information that could possibly be added from uh, previously with year two recruitment. And then under goal area three, family and community engagement, um, understanding the parent portals, how many are registered, and seeing if that initiative could be pushed out and to see what kind of results we'll be able to get from that. And of course, um, in goal area four, one of the reasons why we are here, which is student achievement. Um, and implement coherent viable curriculum. And you made a great point in saying that they understand what it says, they know what it means, and they know what it does. And so um, I think that great job to everyone, great job to our scholars. Uh, we know that there is work to be done, and we're here to support them so that we can be a governance team that support high performing staff, um, organizational operation efficiency, family community engagement, and student achievement, which will lead to um, more student outcomes, and so we're excited to do this work. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And when you say follow up, 
Or you you referring to you you want to meet with Dr. Simmons, or you want him to come back with a report? Yes. And, um, and yes, a follow up to meet with Dr. Simmons either. Um, because I am asking this specifically, I would like for it to be reviewed and discussed before sending out to the entire board um, so that if I have further questions, they can go ahead and be answered. And so that follow-up, whether if it's a check-in or just a phone call to say, hey, Brown, this is what I have, um, I will accept any of those methods of communication for follow-up. Okay. Yes, sir. I captured uh, what it is you're striving for with goal area two, performance objective C. I don't know that I fully understand what we're wanting to provide more clarity or insight on with goal area A. Well, I, I thought he said both, but I may, I may have missed So that. which which one were you on so I can repeat if needed? Two? Yep, goal right, area so two. A, yes. support effective professional learning growth. So if you, specifically what is it that you're looking for like you were able to tell me you know right so we talked about that five uh, that five percent difference is in knowledge at a higher rate whether it's the role of comparison you know we've used let's talk we use thought exchange so being able to just hone in on that five percent difference of which one sir again high performing staff correct performance objective a correct support effective professional learning and growth we spoke about increased percentage of respondents that indicated that professional development highlighted effective practices. I'll follow up with you. Okay. And so we remember we talked about 95% and then it dropped down to 92%. Oh, okay. And there was a 5% difference and you mentioned that there could be several things. And so I just want to know what those things are specifically. Um, you can tell us, I mean, you gave us some, what you may think it is, but I just want to do a follow up to see what okay. those things actually are specifically. Um, as it relates to performance objective A and what support will be needed from that. And of course, goal area three uh, we spoke of and for student yep. achievement. Got Do it. I need to repeat any of those? No. Good? Yep. We'll awesome. Thank you. All right. We're clear? Yes, yes, sir. Clear? All right. Uh, next uh, presentation is from Mr. Byron Jones, our 2025 20, budget outlook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board members. Good, good to see you again. Yes. I wanted to provide you a few nuggets tonight uh, as we continue this, embarking this journey. I think this is the fourth year I've presented to you on a, on a budget. So this is FY25 budget outlook. Uh, I'll show you at the calendar at the end of the presentation where we'll, we'll, we'll repeat what we're going to do in, in subsequent meetings. So uh, I will be uh, communicating effectively to you tonight, hopefully that you can gather uh, this data. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Again, our mission and vision with our distinctive brand, strong leaders, great schools, everything is headed towards empowering each student to graduate college and career ready. Most of my presentations, I'm always talking about the roadmap to success and how we are bottom left aligning resources to the student and staff needs. But again, just to repeat, all of this is inclusive, headed towards that top green box under learning for student achievement. Um, I wanted to share some things that are going on right now. And some of these PowerPoint slides are similar to prior years, but I want to give you a little bit more detail and clarity. So one thing we did this year is uh, my office kind of changed a little bit of the communication mode and the way we're talking and communicating to schools and we're collaborating with Ms. Austin's office. But we actually sent out information last Wednesday to schools, which was uh, at the end of uh, January. Uh, so they have received all of their uh, consolidated funds, both from the general fund and federal funds, uh, to be able to budget over the next 30 days and turn those back in on March 1st. One of the things that we did was ask some of the schools, a lot of the schools sometimes will have questions about personnel allotments and how many staffing personnel. So we've communicated that to them and given them kind of a soft deadline of tomorrow if they uh, want to meet with us so we can support them and kind of go over how we arrived at those figures. So we have heard from, I think, four or five schools at this point. So again, that'll be tomorrow uh, if we hear from any more and then we'll, we'll line up some subsequent meetings with those schools. Uh, we do base the uh, personnel allotments uh, on data uh, through our ramp formula, which is uh, how, how we allocate uh, per, uh, per school. Uh, we do look at October 23 FTE amounts when we're figuring out how much supply money like schools will get. And then we also look at October enrollment and January 2024 attendance whenever we're trying to actually project what the uh, enrollments would be at the schools for next year. 
One little bit of change this year is we actually looked at that data two ways. Uh, Dr. Blassingame, who's in the audience, he, he actually provided some uh, data to me from evaluation and accountability, and then we cross-checked that with some historical averages for the schools so that when we sent those informations out, we looked at it two different ways to anticipate any questions. Um, spe special education money, we actually carve out some supply money based on some restricted, restricted money for the schools, and that is removed from their general fund allocation, which we've also communicated to the schools. And just I wanted to show you at the bottom, we already have budget meetings lined up at the schools for March 11th, 13th, 21st, and 26th. I think Dr. Taylor is coordinating a sheet. I think we've got most of the schools signed up, and I, uh, in the past we have invited the board members. As soon as we can get that uh, uh, list confirmed, I will uh, send that to you, all the board members and Dr. Simmons, and you're invited to come to those meetings. Like I said, it'll be in the, in the month of March. Uh, it's about an hour-long presentation where they'll talk about the school improvement plan and tying uh, objectives to budget uh, characteristics that they'll present. This kind of speaks to that on the next slide, some of the things that they'll speak to about the current state of their school, uh, the resource allocations, if it's you know, making sure that those are aligned to their school improvement plan, and maybe any results from any prior allotments that they in, intend on renewing again and how that was successful at the school level. Also, for out-of-state travel, we normally ask for some of those requests uh, so that we can appropriately account for those. All right, and for the departments, we actually are prepping those budget templates. Those are ready to go. We are actually giving ourselves to the end of the day tomorrow. Those will, those will go out to departments. They're ready, but I just want to proof, proof those a little bit more with my office in the morning. They'll go out by 4.30 tomorrow. They'll be due March 4th back uh, for us, and then we plan on doing a budget meeting on March the 12th with the departments. Uh, so again, those will go out tomorrow. A few items we want to just, what we do know right now, we wanted to just kind of point out a few things. We are always looking at FTE enrollment increases and decreases, and I believe in FY24, this year we're in now, we actually increased a little bit in FTE, which is the first time since I've been employed here that that's happened. Uh, so we're still looking at, the, at that data for next year. Now the legislative session today was day 15. You know, in repeat, they've got 40 days. I think they've, they've agreed to be out right at the end of March. Uh, so at some point in there, we're going to get the allotment sheet and we can verify our FTEs. Hopefully it's going up a little bit more uh, for FY25. But under legislative session, we already know that Governor Kemp uh, has made a recommendation for teacher salary scale increase of $2,500. Uh, and again, who knows if that'll be the final figure, if it'll go up or down or, or whatever. So we do know that that's out there. Uh, teachers retirement system, for the first time in a couple of years, we are going to have a match percentage that we have to put in for. Uh, I think it's 0.8 of a percent that it'll go up, and it's about $500,000 for the district. The 500000 represents all funds, not just general fund, so that's kind of a ballpark figure when we, we projected that. Uh, as Dr. Simmons has already talked about, we're in year two right now of the strategic plan. Next year will be uh, the third year of that. Uh, inflationary increases, we know we talk about this every year, but fuel, et cetera, has always continued to keep going up. It'll It'll go down for a little bit and then it'll go back up. So all of that is still um, uh, out there as far as it could potentially impact our budget. We always talk about longevity step for employees, which is commonly known as a step increase that we will bring to you uh, for your recommend, for a recommendation. Uh, also this year, state health has indicated uh, for the non-certified employees that the, the benefit match is going up from 1195 to 1445 per month. So the certified is currently $1,580 a month that it costs uh, to insure. So that's eighteen dollars to $19,000 a year for certified. So like I said, non-certified is going to go up uh, proportionally, and it's going to cost us almost $1.1 million for just that match. And we do not receive any funding for state health insurance for non-certificated employees. So that's a, a pretty big item that we'll have to consider in the budget. And this last one is just to acknowledge to you that uh, I think Ms. Battle, Dr. Simmons, myself, we're all still working on a uh, GSCS supplemental compensation proposal. Uh, I think Ms. Battle has presented it in January, December. It was a tiered approach, and we went back, and there were several options. We went back and looked at what we could do for all employees, 
So nobody's forgotten about that. We're just waiting to kind of overlay some of the stuff with the governor's office to see which proposal would, would actually be best for our district. And I want to point out something that, that we don't talk about a whole lot of. When we do a salary increase or we're going to propose something, this, this supplemental conversation is, is really geared towards the teaching position, you know, in the classroom. That's what this was uh, uh, mainly for. Uh, Any time that we are offering proposals like that and the governor is also offering a proposal, he is only funding people that we are earning. So we may have a hundred additional positions that we're not actually earning to keep our class sizes lower or they may be paid from federal funds. And we're normally passing this on to them as well. So those unfunded positions can, can generate another hundred to five hundred thousand dollars that that we're not necessarily getting reimbursed for that we have to cover costs. So just want to identify that's kind of a, a variable of why we haven't brought this supplemental compensation back to the board. Also, last year we started our budget proposal to the board earlier, and we got done in May, which was the first time ever here. You know, we, by law we have to be done in June. And so this is, again, another example where we're trying to get ahead of everybody, and then we hear something from the legislature that makes us kind of, you know, pause for just a second to see how we can overlay that back to a recommendation to the board. With that being said, we're actually in February. We're talking about a, just a brief budget outlook tonight. We're gonna to come back in March at the work session. We're gonna give you more of an in-depth uh, in overview with uh, some superintendent priorities. We're still planning to provide you a, uh, a notebook towards the end of March. April, the plan is to host two public hearings, also to present and adopt the tentative budget. May, host another public hearing, present and adopt the final budget. And then in the June, July time frame, we're hopeful to get the final adoption of the millage rate in the public hearing, if that's necessary. So, Mr. Chairman, that is my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, sir. What members, anyone have any questions? Go ahead, Ms. McDonald. Mr. Brown. Hey, Mr. Jones. Yes, ma'am. I know that, you know, it gets really confusing with all these retention supplement it's very confusing, and I'm sure the people that do it every day, it's confusing too. Is there any, yeah, I know you probably can't give me the answer now, but I, I'm really concerned about just only giving, I don't know, the compensation to teachers only at building level. My wish is that it could be for all certified personnel at building level, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because 10 years ago when I retired after a 30 plus year career, Today's world is totally different. What our, what our frontline people face every day, and all of you in this room know this, but I just want to publicly say, their work is, is, is very difficult today in the environments in which they have to work. The, um, you know, I hear, I've heard principals tell me stories of, you know, what they had, have had to endure what teachers have had to endure, what custodians, nutrition, I mean, everybody. So I, I just wanted us to be open-minded about this as a board and maybe obviously take care of teachers, but I think we need to probably consider taking care of all frontline employees in our buildings because it's just really important work and it's very hard work. Just for a point of clarity, um, when we find, okay. You want him to respond or? Okay. Well, not necessarily, but I don't want to be the one that, you know, I don't, I'm not cutting you off either, so. <laughs> I mean, I preface my statement by saying that I know you can't give me a figure tonight. I mean, I don't know what more I could say to put him at ease. <laughs> La Perilla. You know, I, I, La just want, I, just, I just want this board to stay Number open. Number five. I just want this board to stay open-minded about. But I understand what you're saying, and I don't want you to think that. Way. And this is weird.
It's a task. It's a task. It's what? Yeah. Who said that? It's a yeah. what? It's a task. They've come up with the money for everyone. If uh, you know, if the governor hadn't allotted allotted money for those that got it, they wouldn't have got it. But for everyone to get it, it's going to take us doing a lot of planning, setting money aside uh, to be able to do that. I mean, we, and we may be able to show our employees, you know, a, a roll in, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just to just come up with a plan to just take take better care of our frontline people that are in this every day. They are in the trenches every day. That's it. Thanks. Anybody else got any questions? I, I got a couple. Uh, well, one is a request. I don't know if every board member would like to have it, but Mr. Jones, could I get a copy of the budget template that, that uh, we're using for this year? So that when I, if I, if I sit in on any meetings, I kind of have a, a little direction on what they use to formulate their budget. So if you could send me the, that template, I just want to I just want to lay eyes on it. Right. I can send you a, a blank template or yeah, you know, just H a blank, just a blank template. I don't, I, I ain't got no numbers to put in there, but just just send me a blank template. And you so want I, me to password protect it for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can send you that. I, I I'm, I'm chuckling because I know the departments, uh, they they all have different funding levels in all the schools, so. If I send you, I'm, I can send you. They're all going to be a little bit different in their in their formula, the way that's calculated. Okay. Okay. But I'll okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get you something. Yes, Understood. Sir. Understood. Also, uh, I wanted to know what what percentage number are we using for the inflationary increase? Well, we we're not necessarily back in the old days. I would just take three or four percent and mark up stuff. But but really, the way we're budgeting here on the departments is more zero based. So uh, Patrick Martin just came to me a while ago and talked to me about his fuel budget for next year. Did you? And so I told him he's getting his template tomorrow. So he's going to actually look at quoted material, and we're not just we're not just looking at a blank markup for that. You know, by the time we pass the budget, GSBA, et cetera, will be able, will be have given us good solid quotes for insurance. You know, we we're not just marking that up. Uh, there are items we could do that for, but that's just not how we've been doing that. So we have more solid information before we actually recommend the final budget to you. Okay, so so each whoever they're 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 using their own inflationary number that where they've kind of watched their market like transportation is that that's right. What's he, going? Uh, Mr. He's just an example, but he will turn in some good solid information and and the reason for our meeting is cabinet to kind of scrutinize that a little bit and say we have you considered that, that, that this is going to be waived next year maybe you didn't know that it's going to make the maybe we have more forecasted information and then until we arrive at a solid number uh, you know with uh, us getting our fuel uh, and, and I'm just a little bit more familiar with that than some you know whoever we get in our fuel from do they not supply uh, a pre-budget inflationary increase number. Yeah, I'm. I'm assuming he can get what I would call a rack price or something that a they would. Rack, we yeah. could. We could look see if that could be locked in. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 That's that's it. Um, thank you, Mr. Jones. But if I can just lay eyes on that template that they're they're going to be using, uh, I would just like to, uh, you know, lay eyes on it. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other question from any other board members? Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have uh, policy development uh, literacy. Who's going to handle that? <coughs> Mr. Brown. Thank yeah. you very much. <clears throat> uh, board members, we've uh, talked a lot about policy development and the, pretty much the roles of what the Board of Education is supposed to do. Uh, manage, hire, superintendent, uh, pass a balanced budget, and to create policy for our school district. And in this quest to create policy for our school district, um, we are looking at creating the first ever literacy policy for our school district. Um, 
in conversation with many other school districts across the state and across the nation, seeing what a literacy policy will do, outlining how it supports and what it directs the superintendent to do as it relates to student outcomes. And so today we are going to have a brief discussion on what this policy would look like. Um, this is something that I would like to get the input from every board member that is up here. This is a policy that we are going to create together. We are going to be through this process of whether if it's community meetings, um, town hall meetings to understand what the public wants because when you're thinking about literacy, companies are deciding whether or not they want to move to Griffin Spalding. Mrs. Barbara Jo Cook, longest serving member of this board who works in workforce development, who works in higher education, she knows that a lot um, of companies, they ask about our school district, they ask about um, how we're performing. And so I think this policy will just give us more teeth, will give us more skin in the game and put our money where our mouth is. Um, we have a budget of um, where we are able to direct and allocate funds. And um, we know that teaching and learning, we know that um, high performing staff, student achievement, that's where a majority of our money goes. And so with this policy, we will be able to speak to um, what the state is saying and then as what it relates to, to us as a local school district. Um, speaking with Dr. Taylor today, she definitely gave me some things to think about as we are developing the policy. And one of the things that, uh, and I, I will share this with you, because this is very important. Um, this was released on January 16th of 2024 from the Georgia Department of Education, looking at aligning the state literacy policies and practices. So looking at two legislative bills, one is House Bill 538, which uh, goes into connecting Georgia early literacy and Georgia's K through 12 English and language arts standards. And of course, Senate Bill 48, Georgia's dyslexia efforts. And so at this time, we just want to have an open discussion as to, as a policymaker in, in, in this, what you would like to see in this literacy policy so that we can um, get a draft, put it out in front of many different groups to be able to give us feedback and um, ready to rock and roll from there. So at this time, I just want to open it up for uh, board members to provide input and myself and Dr. Simmons. Uh, we met today. Uh, we'll be looping Dr. Taylor into the conversation to kind of help guide this work as well. And so uh, we'll be taking notes so that we make sure that we're able to capture um, the vision of every board member up here. Uh, thank you for bringing this to the table because it is, it is a very important issue, uh, Mr. Brown. But uh, I think we was at the GSBA. There, there was, I think, like what uh, Fulton, uh, Cobb, was it Cobb? It, it, you, you know, so that we won't have to just Fulton and Marriott say that I know it was somewhere north. Of, uh, but is it uh, we we can we can we can designate you as a point person to do the research of seeing, you know, those those policies, looking at their policies, uh, the the state DOE's policy, and so we can formulate our policy. Would, would that be a good start? That is a great start. Um, one of the things that um, Erica Mitchell, the current chair of Atlanta Public Schools, um, she and I have had a lengthy conversation about this work. Uh, she sponsored the literacy policy for Atlanta Public Schools. Um, Angela Orange was one of the sponsors in uh, Marietta City Schools. And so, um, yes, using Atlanta Public Schools, using other policies, and um, not only not here in Georgia, but across our country but being able to tailor it to fit the needs of our scholars in our district. Um, definitely want to be able to get the feedback from employees. Um, just an idea. Um, but let's not go there. I just, I guess if we can continue to have the discussion on as to what it will look like as we continue to build uh, the draft and what the policy will say. Um, like I said, I definitely want to be able to get the feedback from each board member uh, so that we know the direction 
that we want to, to take collectively? Well, well, I think, like I said, to, to start that conversation, if, if you would take on the task of securing those that have somewhat of a policy, we can lay eyes on it and, and we, like you say, we can have discussion and cater it for us, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of a sight learner. You know, if I see something, <laughs> you know, I, I, I take off a little faster than starting from, from scratch. Uh, so if you would take, take the point on doing that, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm speaking, uh, I, I think Mr. Dawson's watching, hope he's okay with that. But if you could be the point person and gather that information that, so that we can start the conversation and, okay. the, and the input. Yeah, and we've already began to do that. Like I have a couple drafts with me today. Okay. Um, as okay. we were just, like I said, to just come in, um, this information was put in our packet so that we were ready to have this discussion. And so. Um, the draft? No, not the draft. Oh, just, okay. Just the, the, the putting it on the agenda on to know agenda. that we're going okay. to discuss okay. it. Okay. Um, and being proactive so that we could have some type of direction as we leave this place. Okay. Um, I definitely want it to be a collective effort um, and not just something that Brown of the First is bringing and, and, and shoving and pushing. And so, okay. Would um, will, will you be so kind, I, I would love to see, get a copy of those drafts. Yes, sir. We'll, yeah. we'll provide those to you via email. Okay. Well, you, you see I'm trying to, trying to lessen my work, you know. I appreciate uh, the gentleman <laughs> has much passion for which he speaks. <laughs> I think okay. our colleague of the fifth may have uh, – you have some discussion. Go ahead. Thank you. Jump in. House Bill 538 deals with this? Okay. Yes. Okay. Are there any other House Bills that deal with this? Yes. Um, and Dr. Taylor could probably speak to those two bills, um, House Bill 538 and um, Senate Bill 48, being that she's the one that um, said, hey, are you considering uh, these two pieces of legislation as you develop this policy? Dr. Those, Taylor? Those are current, currently being dealt with? This session? Already passed. Okay. I can look them up. There's no problem. They oh, they've already passed. Okay. That's it. Okay. And I'll, I would be happy to support this, and I'll be happy to do the research that Mr. Holmes can't do, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's Just good. Just kidding, Mr. Holmes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. No, no problem at all. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for bringing that to the table. Uh, you know, that would be a historical document uh, for us to have. So thank you for that. And, and just going back to, um, I know that the, hold on, Mr. Doss just text. What are you talking about? Are there any other groups um, <laughs> I, in, in your cohort across the nation, uh, school board partners that have policies that we could? Yeah, we can. Um, we can um, maybe do some Zoom calls or some Google Meet calls with other school board members across the country, and they can just talk about their experience um, in drafting this policy and what they went through as a board collectively to draft that information so that um, when it's time to talk to the public that we have something to stand on and it's a working document that we can fix okay. and update as we get the feedback. Okay. Um, we, we just, superintendent just did a presentation of a strategic plan and giving us an update and when we're looking at student achievement um, and we're looking at the performance objective of being able to implement coherent viable curriculum, this policy is very, very important. As we look at where we are as a target and where we actually are, um, we know that as we continue to move forward that, you know, I, I think about, you know, in, in, even in, in all of this, um, you know, our why and what we do what we do. And why we want the best student outcomes and why we want the best talent, why we want the best of everything so that you know, we have policies like this and we can stand on, and it provides clear direction to the superintendent um, as it relates to student achievement and the student outcomes um, as one of the, the main reasons in, in developing this policy. Um, we know that literacy success requires a combination of high quality, early learning experiences, explicit and systematic instruction, not only during elementary school, but also during middle school and high school and it also it takes strong community support. Um, and looking at other policies, Leader Holmes, to your point, there are some uh, definitions that 
we want to put in the working document and looking at these definitions, I was talking with the superintendent earlier, and I think this is a way that we can involve and engage the employees of the district, especially our um, teaching and learning department, our content coordinators. Um, there are three things that we want to consider in this policy as it relates to definitions. We want to talk about high quality, what that looks like, if there may be rubrics included in that. Um, scientifically based research as well as evidence based and so in providing these uh, we have the textbooks definition but I think what we need to look in and look at is how it best fits our community and coming up with a definition that is readable to everybody that sees it so they know the direction that we want to go in and the three different ways that we want to be able to provide evidence based scientifically based research and high quality instruction um, and we know that there are several groups that are already working on this work, whether if it was through EPI, whether if it's through uh, teaching and learning in one of their support, well, not support groups, but focus groups that they have with literacy. Uh, this information could be used and gathered, um, which they're already doing the work, but put it in policy form so there's a clear distinction as to what the Board of Education says and what we're directing the superintendent to do as it relates to student outcomes and literacy. Sounds great. Sounds All right. great. All right. Any other comments before we move to the our next subject? All right. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, the Board of Education Scholar Representative discussion. Who, who's going to lead that? Mr. Brown, go ahead, Mr. Brown. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back before you again. Um, this is one of the real reasons why we are here. We are here for our scholars. Uh, this policy is, has been, since I joined the Board of Education, we've always looked for ways to be able to involve our scholars in this legislative process. We see through our meetings that we have scholars that do our announcements. We have scholars that where we highlight, um, bang the gavel, and all these different things that that puts the scholars back on the forefront. Uh, when I ran for the school board in 2018, um, one of the things that, one of the main reasons why I ran is because I remember there was a group of scholars that were protesting and I think they wanted to celebrate Genesis 6 and the administration did not want them to do that. And I remember coming to um, a board meeting and um, seeing that scholars were not heard. Uh, the chair at that time, um, actually decided to limit scholars in their ability to be able to speak. And I remember uh, approaching the podium and yielding uh, five minutes of my time to five different scholars from Griffin High School. Um, I remember there was much discussion and debate if I could actually do that during that time as a, as a uh, constituent. And at that time, our board attorney, Tim Shepard, um, in his way of saying, I hate that he can do it, but yes, he can do it. And um, which led to the reason why we are here in order to make sure that we are listening to our scholars. Um, having a scholar representative on this board will help to uh, close a lot of the gaps that we have. A lot of us, we may go out, we visit schools, we talk to them, but it's time to get down to seriously looking at um, these outcomes and putting them at the forefront. The superintendent has done a great job, has done an amazing job in getting feedback from scholars with his um, advisory committees. And so um, want to be able to uh, kind of use those um, at times when you meet with those um, advisory groups so that we can get their feedback as well. And so again, this is where it leads to discussion. <laughs> discussion from this body, discussion from those who are up here so that we can, again, get some direction, um, create some discussion so that we can move forward and, and have something in place because um, I, I'm sure that I don't know if anybody who is against having a scholar um, as a school board representative um, and, and talking through what it looks like not necessarily voting powers, but having their, their voice is one of the most important things that we can do as advocates. We all ran of, to be advocates for brighter futures, however you want to put it, whether it's, it's families, children, and scholars, whether it's scholars first. Uh, we are here to ensure that our scholars have an enjoyable experience 
um, and that they're able to give us the feedback and the input so that we can make their uh, time in Griffin Spalding County School System an enjoyable one. So at this time, if there are any discussion or feedback or yays or nays that you may feel in your heart as we talk about adding a scholar representative to the Board of Education. I, I, would, ask, I would ask the superintendent to kind of start this discussion off on, on what are your thoughts or, uh, as how you may perceive this happening or occurring. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as, as Mr. Brown mentioned, we do have an existing structure where we, we are looking to amplify student voices. Granted, it doesn't you know, represent every or each student, but it represents a swath of each school at the secondary level. Um, from my perspective, it's really just a matter of trying to support the board's efforts regarding making sure that students are aware of the opportunity. Uh, maybe providing recommendations or suggestions to the board on, on how to communicate uh, the opportunity, um, reiterating, you know, the, the need to ensure that the roles uh, of the students are clear, but also a value add in the process. Uh, I am not against it. I think we're already, you know, moving in that direction. Um, what you don't know is that I've already uh, staffed a similar effort um, prior to this meeting, just trying to bring uh, that type of recommendation to you. Uh, and so the, the fact that the board is considering it, um, you know, I, I think there's confluence in that regard, but you know, again, I, I don't have a whole lot of details in the moment, uh, but I can, I can certainly stay in touch with you to you know, make sure that I'm clear on what it is that you're striving for and, and how I can be a support in that effort. I, I, uh, my thoughts on it would would be, you know, with us having the student advisory, uh, if we're specifically looking for one student representative, that's what I assume that you would like to uh, us to move toward, Mr. Brown, one student representative. And so that is something that we can discuss and how that's gonna look as it relates to the makeup of it. Um, right now, we look at, like I said, superintendent and I met today to kind of go over just kind of an outline. But again, this work is led by the board. This work is led by the governance team. And so um, whatever suggestions that you may have as it relates, if we want to start out with maybe a rotation of three, three scholars that we select and they're able to rotate, um, because much training and development is going to have to go into it. Uh, think about many of us, when we got elected, we were just thrown into a training and say, hey, you know, go to this training and, and get everything. And so uh, we don't want to just throw them into the fire. We want to be able to train them. We want to be able to um, answer any of their questions and make them feel comfortable as they will be here to represent and, and have that scholar voice. So uh, whether if it's three, two, or one, or having a rotation, I am open. Um, the end result in this is to just see that we have a scholar representative on this board. You know, I, I was, go ahead, Ms. McDonald. No, you go ahead. You, you know, you go ahead, go ahead. Ladies first, age before beauty. Go ahead. <laughs> I threw you off with that. <laughs> uh, Mr. Brown, I was just Googling and, uh, and, and they, you're doing research? Yes, sir, always. Oh my God, that's always. amazing. Always. Appreciate it. Always. Be sure that's in the minutes, please. <laughs> yeah. Let the record reflect. <laughs> <laughs> the, re the research uh, is, is uh, actually coming from governance and uh, leadership site that I frequent uh, sometimes, but uh, they're saying that with the student representatives, so they, they, they have some inconsistency or no uniformity uh, about student uh, representative on, on board. Some uh, have official seat with the board and some can't even sit with the board. So there's a varying uh, degree of how how this is used, but I, I think I think we're moving in the right direction. We can do the research and see what works best for us, 
because I think the ultimate goal is to have a student representative which will have a voice, students will have a voice uh, that we can tap into. Uh, but there is, there, there, there are some that are already doing it. Um, a few, I see a few states that I'm kind of surprised, especially seeing, seeing Kentucky. Uh, I wouldn't think Kentucky would be that progressive, but um, very, oh, I forgot you for Kentucky. <laughs> in education. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm all in favor of, I guess we just have to, have to look at how we're going to uh, get to where we're going and uh, that's going to that's gonna suit us, but I'm all in favor of it. And that's the beauty of being able to, you know, draft legislation or draft policies and initiatives is that all the minds get together and you get to craft it, you get to shape it. It's like when you're born and you, you, I know your big mama probably used to tell you, you know, tell me hell in the shape of your head. Is that shit? <laughs> right, and so you, we get to shape it, we get to, to mold it to what it is so that it represents and it reflects um, the scholar voice that is so important to us and why we do the work that we do. So it's good to, to have you on board to support it um, and for you to do your research that you have done um, in our meeting. I think it leaves us uh, great discussion in, in being able to move forward and be able to shape it the way that will benefit Griffin Spalding County School System. Yes, sir. No doubt. Thank you so any much. Any other board members? Any comment, Ms. Cook? Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. You got any comment? I applaud Mr. Brown for bringing both of these items. Um, uh, I think these would be great topics for uh, our retreat so that we have time to talk about them and That's right. we've had time to smart. hear it and then we can think about it. Sounds great. It's I would just uh, support the idea of looking into it and talking about it. And uh, I think all of you know that I'm always wanting to include students, parents, kids, and employees. That's, that's why I was wanted to do this work. And uh, to not be open to that would uh, go against everything that I stand for. So I support this and I'll be happy to do uh, some research before next week also. And let me just close by saying I want to say thank you to the superintendent for taking time during our check-in uh, to, to just kind of, you know, give an overview in both literacy policy and the, this uh, BOE scholar representative to Mrs. Cook and Mr. Holmes. You guys have been on this board a long time, and I'm sure that um, you guys can provide much insight and shape how it, it is going to look. Um, I know as a millennial, we... Um, you know, we are, if it's not a seat, we're gonna bring a folding chair. Um, if it's not on the menu, we're gonna put it on there. And so um, the push is for a scholar representative, and that is one of the things I would like to see before I leave this board. Thank you. All right. With that being said, you had anything else, Ms. Cook? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to our next section, uh, uh, information item uh, we have on here, nutrition excess cash plan which was included in our package we also have a revised executive session affidavit form which we'll be using tonight the new one uh, <laughs> uh, we also have the griffin spalding county school facility rental and usage report uh, but i would since he's here mr wheeler uh i would like to ask a request uh, through the superintendent to our nutrition director, you know, seeing the, the ex excess cash uh, that we had, um, everybody, everybody should have the, the uh, memorandum in front of them. But uh, I would like to ask that, uh, in moving forward that we that we get with uh, the middle schools and high schools uh, Mr. Stikes with the athletic directors of the people that who are 
tasked to uh, oversee the athletic programs, it would be good if we could uh, provide meals for the kids who are participating in these activities, uh, see how far we can branch out. And, and, uh, and I mentioned Mr. Stike's name because I think everybody, if we're going to do this, everybody needs to be educated on the process and, and how to go about tapping into uh, what Mr. Wheeler can offer because he, we had something set up for uh, the high school, both high school, but I don't think it was ever utilized. Uh, but Mr. Wheeler was ready to provide a service to him. But I, I think going forward, we could better serve our scholar uh, athletes uh, by providing some type of meal or snack or whatever uh, if, we, if we are still in the position of having excess cash uh, through our nutrition department. What do you think, Ms. Dr. Simmons? I, I will, I, I'm in support of anything that we can do to lessen the burden um, on, on the extracurricular activities. I'm not sure if there is anything that we can do within regulations regarding the excess cash plan. I think they may want to know how might those excess funds be used to improve the program. We may have to look at a different means of, of lessening some of that burden, whether it be sharing it um, or, or something. But uh, Mr. Wheeler is here. Let me get you to come to the podium really quick um, and, and succinctly give me uh, your, your thoughts on if, if this request or this idea is, is, is feasible or, or permissible. Really quick. I was getting ready to hit y'all with a parliamentary inquiry. <laughs> I, think you, I think you explained it well, Dr. Simmons. There are limitations to what can be done with that. Um, and that's what you, I provided to you, equipment, things like that. But I'll wait for any um, further instructions you have. Okay, so Mr. Chair, let, let me continue to talk with and figure out where the opportunities reside, update you, and, and, and see if we can thought partner our way into helping schools, uh, particularly these extracurricular programs. But having overseen a federal program like that, I know we will have to stay within those Stay within those, right. Mm -hmm. And I fully understand that. That's why I want to you know, make sure you, uh, you run, it runs through well, you uh, and Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. I, I understand the need. Um, Everyone is pinched, right. and, and so those who may have been in a better position to, to, to be philanthropic um, may not be in that same position, uh, and, and we have multiple athletic programs, six schools, multiple programs, and, and what generally happens is we, we end up knocking on the same door, all six schools, all programs. I understand that. Um, there may be ways that we can help. I'm, I'm not sure what those are, uh, but I will, I will stay uh, engaged with you as well as Mr. Wheeler, Mr. Stikes, and, and the principals via their athletic directors uh, to figure out where our opportunities are. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, thank sir. you, sir. Uh, with that being said, uh, would, 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 while we have a captive audience, would the board members prefer to do uh, comments before we go into executive sessions? Uh, I start with uh, on my left since we only have one person with Ms. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. That is not how we do that. Okay, well, Mr. Brown, uh, it may not be how we, we, we normally do it, but I think we have a little leverage to be able to do it. Uh, we, we have a captive audience. We come back, we're not online, we don't have uh, a captive audience. So I, I think it would be appropriate for board members to make their comments. If that's okay, uh, I look to my extreme left. Uh, if that's within, I think it is within the privy of, of the chair. Already. Thank you. We can modify the agenda, right. 
Okay. Uh, the chair would like to entertain motion. Uh, a motion. We got a motion. Give me a good second. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Your right hand. We got three. Any opposed? I oppose because of the way that the procedure was done. All right. Uh, we got three. Got a three-one vote. Any comments? We'll start with Miss McDonald. Mine will be very quick. Mr. Ballard, I wanted to give a shout out to you and your team. I, I had a phone call from a substitute teacher this week, or late last week, I really can't remember. I immediately called Mr. Battle. Problem solved. Um, I don't know how my number got to her, but I'm so thankful she called me and your team went over there to Cowan Middle and I really appreciate you taking care of that situation. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to George Hill Elementary and Miss Loki. I went to their fine arts presentation last Friday, and it was just incredible to expose those students to so many different things at such young ages. Is, is it just made my heart really smile. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Jordan Hill. I've already spoken to Dottie and, and Dr. Bell and um, and Mr. Loki since you're in the room. Please go home. I, I just uh, and tell Miss Loki how much I appreciate that. Jordan Hill is in my district, and they did a, just a superb job. It was just incredible. Thank you. That's it. Thank All you, right. Mr. Holmes. We'll go to uh, my right, Miss Cook. I just want to give a big shout out to faculty, staff, students for the great job you've done this winter. Since you've come back after Christmas, we've had some hard days with inclement weather. You've missed some school. It's been a cold winter. And you all have done an amazing job, and it's time now for winter break very soon. So I wish you a great week during winter break. Uh, take care of yourselves. Come back and re be refreshed and ready to go again till our next break. But I thank you for all you do. All right, we'll go to our uh, far right, Mr. Brown. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Holmes. Lonnie, if you could, can you... Go online and find a picture of Leroy Johnson, Senator Leroy Johnson. Uh, February is Black History Month. And so as we look at the contributions of African Americans, not only here in our great city of Griffin, Georgia, Raymond Head, uh, uh, Otis Head, Mary Stenson, Zach Holmes, Mike Kendall, Fannie Delaney, um, but the image on the screen is the first black state senator elected after Reconstruction here in the state of Georgia. That is Senator Leroy Johnson, who ran in 1962, was elected to office in 1963. He won the election for state senator in Georgia's 38th Senate District, which is presently held by uh, Senator Horacina Tate, who was born in Griffin and moved from Griffin when she was four years old. But in 1963, uh, Senator Leroy Johnson became the first African-American senator elected after Reconstruction. Uh, he was an attorney. He uh, helped to get Muhammad Ali to fight here in Georgia and a lot of other things. Um, when I was teaching eighth grade Georgia studies <clears throat> and they were doing a, um, a thing honoring him at Ebenezer Baptist Church where he was a member, um, I took myself and 35 of my scholars to Ebenezer to be able to meet him. So I was, I've put it out there, but I was able to meet Senator Leroy Johnson and have a great conversation with him and see what it was like back in the day. Um, he was then defeated in uh, 1975 by Senator Tate's dad, Horace Tate. Um, and he was his mentor, but then he ran against him and, and beat him. And now um, presently, uh, Senator Horacina Tate, who's from Griffin, who lives in the 38th Senate District, has represented District 38 for 25 years. And so I just want to give a shout out to Senator Leroy Johnson. And one more person I want you to look up, Nadine Thomas. Senator Nadine Thomas. Leader Holmes, you're familiar with, with Senator Thomas? Good friend of mine. Good friend of yours as you guys work together uh, at Spalding Regional. Uh, click on the first one over there, right there. Right there. 
So that is uh, State Senator Nadine Thomas. She was the first female elected to the Georgia State Senate. Uh, she ran for office in 1992 and took office in 1993. Senator Nadine Thomas represented the 10th Senate District uh, from the time that she was elected in 92, took office in 93, until 2007 when uh, Senator Emmanuel Jones um, took the seat. And so uh, good to highlight two great Georgians. One, Senator Leroy Johnson, the first African-American state senator elected after Reconstruction, and Senator Nadine Thomas, the first African-American female elected to the Georgia State Senate. Uh, that's my moment in black history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nadine was a nursing administrator uh, at Spalding Regional. So uh, thank you for that, Mr. Brown. Uh, on a sadder note, I, I would like to make mention uh, of an employee that we, we lost over the weekend, Mr. Morris Matthews. He was a custodian at Moreland Road Elementary. Uh, so I ask that we keep his family in our prayers as they go through this process. Uh, I, I would like to echo what Ms. Cook said, you know, uh, about the times, <clears throat> this time of year, you know, we, we st the phone calls get a little increased to board members about uh, student situations, graduation is upon us, uh, coming up uh, pretty fast, but um, I just want to thank the staff as well for enduring some of the, um, some of the issues that they deal with on a daily basis and I, I just remind them to finish strong uh, we just want to uh, complete the year on a on a positive note I know we are a little tired but let's let's go forth with uh, that extra effort that uh, these students and scholars will need sometimes so let's keep them at the forefront and uh, again we just thank you for all that you do we have uh, an item for executive session to discuss or deliberate upon the appointment, employment, compensation, hearing, hiring, I'm sorry, disciplinary action or dismissal or periodic evaluation or rating of a public office officer or employee. Um, so at this time, we will uh, have a motion to go into executive session. Can we so have a moved. motion? Got a motion. Can we get a second? Got a second. All in favor? Discussion? Is, Go which, ahead. For, Discussion? Yeah, for everything that you just read is what we're going to executive session for? Pardon me? Oh, no, no, no. This, uh, right. uh, uh, this is the new affidavit. The new affidavit, as you can see, is a little bit more wordy. Right. So, uh, but for the purpose, uh, and board attorney, correct me, please, uh, but for the purpose, for the public, it needs to be stated why we are going into executive session, to, right? We're going into executive session to discuss or deliberate uh, upon the uh, appointment or employment of an uh, of, uh, employee personnel. Yes. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. I'm good. So all in favor, raise your right hand. For all, let the record show. At this time, we will uh, go into executive session. Uh, I don't expect to see anybody when I come out, when we come out. So we'll take this time to say thank you all for hanging in there. Good to see everybody that I hadn't spoken to. Uh, always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, you all drive safe, get home to your families. At this time, sound of the gavel, we're going into executive session.